Welcome back, brothers and sisters. I am Braden. This is Langley Outdoors Academy, the place where we not only talk about what's going on in the gun world, but also how we're going to fix it together. And the content that I've got for you today is an incredibly special treat. This is a bombshell interview. You are not going to want to miss a second of it with the Attorney General of Missouri, Andrew Bailey. This guy is a rock star in the making. You need to see this entire thing. It's like a 15-minute interview. This goes from the Second Amendment all the way to Facebook, goes to the, sec the uh, SCOTUS. This is massive. And there's some things in here that you simply have not heard anywhere else regarding the SAPA, which he is directly involved in. Everything that I've got for you is only possible from you guys. Making sure you hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, turn the notification bell on, and please let me hear you in the comments and send this to everyone because this is an interview you're going to need to see. And without much more, let's get right to it. All right, so people, as I mentioned in the introduction, I am honored to have a very, very special guest that has a lot of expertise on something that you guys have seen a whole lot of on this channel, particularly the SAPA, the Second Amendment Protection Act. This is something massive, and who better than to walk through that than the actual sitting Attorney General of Missouri himself, Andrew Bailey. Andrew Bailey has a background that will really resonate with you guys. He's a father of four, prosecutor, a decorated a veteran of the armed forces, and the sitting AG. Andrew, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. This is a big honor. Hey, man, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, dude, it, when you actually said yes, I was like, sweet, this is incredible, because <laughs> You are the guy who I can get direct answers from on something that my audience has been following for a while, the SAPA, right? Because the thing about the SAPA is it's such an innovative approach to the gun control agenda that the left has through the Biden administration. I mean, really, it's it's very similar to following the sanctuary cities approach that the left does with immigration, right? I mean, I'm not yeah. off base on that, right? Well, it's close. Yeah. I mean, look, the... This is about protecting our right, God-given right, to keep and bear arms. That's why it's the Second Amendment Preservation Act. But it's also right. about the Tenth Amendment. And the question is, do states still retain any sovereignty under our system of government? And the Tenth Amendment, as your audience will remember, uh, says that you know any authority not given to the federal government or deprived to the states is enjoyed by the states and the people of the states. So if the mm -hmm. state of Missouri wants to say, we're not going to cooperate with federal officials, unconstitutional gun registrations, unconstitutional gun grabs, the state has a right under the 10th Amendment to codify that in law. And that's what Missouri has done. Now, the mm -hmm. Biden administration was incensed. They're apoplectic. How dare anyone <laughs> tell them we're not going to carry out your unconstitutional mandates? And so they have sued the state of Missouri. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, standing is a real issue here. The state mm -hmm. law is a is a codification of the anti-commandeering doctrine found in jurisprudence from the United States Supreme Court interpreting the 10th Amendment, and the federal government can't show how they're harmed at all. We don't limit them. We just say state officials enforce state law, not federal law. Right, and that's and that's where it gets so fascinating because this has been kind of a journey, right? So I don't remember the initial year. I, I want to say it was 2022. It may have been 2021 when the SAPA was passed. Yeah, um, that's, uh, yeah. I, I'm, it was very it was in that time frame right after Biden yeah. started really going after the Second Amendment. Yeah. And one of the things in this journey is originally it was basically put under an injunction, said you can't do that anymore. And now it's going through the entire process now. And it just came out of the Eighth Circuit. So this is where it gets really fascinating because you're bringing in the Tenth Amendment. You're bringing in the Second Amendment. You bring in all of these pieces. But from your perspective, the Eighth Circuit, when it came down, what did it really mean to you? Like, when they said, no, this can this injunction can stay, like in Missouri, you can't enforce this. What was your initial takeaway from that ruling? Federal overreach. Okay. Uh, federal judiciary is rubber stamping mm -hmm. the Biden administration's federal overreach. And again, the question that we're posing here is, do states still have any sovereignty? Can states make up their own minds and, and decide for their own uh, people how that they're going to enforce state law? And again, right. I'm looking at this and saying, the federal government under our constitutional system, the federal go government is a government of limited authority. The only authority the federal government has is those powers enumerated in the United States Constitution. And the states under the 10th Amendment and the people of the states have all of the residual power. Mm -hmm. And so does that residual power still mean anything? Can a state codify the anti-commandeering doctrine? That's the question. And look, we're going to appeal. I'm, pr I'm proud right. to announce... We're going to appeal this. We're going to seek a petition for writ of certiorari at the United States Supreme Court. We have more nice. than 100 days to do that. So we're going to take some time, pose this question the right way, get our briefs together and get that up to the Supreme Court and pose that question to them. Oh, that's excellent. So, I mean, like you can you can genuinely and confidently say 
well, we're going the next step, baby, because you feel that confident in the arguments you put forward that it's the federal overreach is just too egregious. I mean, that's kind of what I'm picking up from you because this whole, you know, I mean, I'm sure you're very, very fluent. I know a lot of the audiences as well. There's this propensity for all these circuits to lean certain ways. And it's always find the right circuit to put this thing in for gun control, for not gun control. And it always seems to go to this next level. So in this case, we've seen it with pistol braces. We've seen it with uh, frames and receivers. You're saying it's going, we're, we're pursuing the SCOTUS for sure. Yeah, look, the highest court in the land needs to weigh in on this. And, you know, again, the mm-hmm. question before them is going to be, do states have any sovereignty? Can a state codify the anti-commandeering doctrine? And does standing matter? Again, the Department of Justice has sued the state of Missouri, claiming that they're harmed. How? Demonstrate the right. harm. And if you look at the right. if you look at the opinion from the three-judge panel at the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, the court kind of brushes over that and doesn't really address that issue. It's like, well, mm-hmm. the, the DOJ says that they're harmed, and so we, we they, you know, jump— Tie ball goes to uh, right. Tie goes to the runner. Jump ball goes to them. I, I don't. I reject that. Like if I went to court, I would have to prove standing under Article Three, the cases and controversies requirement. Mm-hmm. The Department of Justice should have the same burden, and so that's mm-hmm. going to be the question before the court. And you know whether or not they're standing, and whether or not DOJ can actually demonstrate that they're harmed in any way uh, is directly correlated to the anti commandeering question. And so both the merits and standing are tied up in a lot of ways on that mm-hmm. central contested issue. And so that's what we're going to put before the court. That's awesome. Um, I, I cannot wait to cover that and just watch that happen because we've had a lot of things that have come down from the Supreme Court that have been very beneficial for us recently, particularly in the Second Amendment. I mean, from the standpoint of the Bruin decision, the Cargill decision, the Looper Enterprises decision with Chevron de- Doctrine and all the executive um, bureaucracies. Yeah. Um, that would be a sweet one to put on top. But I actually... I've got a question for you about the ruling that the Eighth Circuit put down because I I read it one way and I'd really love to get your take on it. Um, one of the main things that they put in this um, in this decision was that the state has the opportunity to ignore a law if it's a valid law, but if the state calls it an invalid law, then they can't do that because you're invalidating a federal law. Am, am I way off base on that? Or because I remember seeing that in the actual document, they were really hung up on basically saying Missouri has to say it's valid, but I'm ignoring it versus invalid and I'm ignoring it. Did did I miss that? Yeah, no, I I think you're getting that right. And I think really what that speaks to is the fact that both the Department of Justice and the three judge panel we drew at the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals Mm -hmm. are more concerned about what the state statute says than what it actually does. And I think they're really focused on some preamble language and are ignoring the fact that all we're saying is, is that state, the apparatuses of state and local government can't be coerced by the federal officials. That's all we're saying. Federal government, you go enforce federal law. State will enforce state law. And again, that's the proper relationship under the 10th Amendment. That shouldn't be a novel concept. And I think that the uh, kind of uh, terse, uh, abbreviated analysis that the court provided on those issues kind of speaks to the, the weakness in the decision that was rendered. Gotcha. And and that makes total sense. But it's just some things in there that that's one of the things that stood out. But I like the approach that you're you're speaking on of going forward from states versus federal and overreach. I mean, I think that's a very strong argument. I think that's a I would love to see that get taken up by the SCOTUS because that would be a fun one to listen to, because just watching the DOJ try to defend that position would be an um, interesting exercise. I can (laughs) I can tell you that. So where do you think it's going to go? Kind of wrapping the sap apart. Like, what do you think the. Do you think they're going to take it up? Do you think they'll ignore it? Like, what's the likelihood? You know, my hope would be that the Supreme Court would take the case and that we would be up arguing the case, uh, you know, in next February or March and mm-hmm. that we would bring home a win in June. I think this is an important question. Nice. And again, it's not it's about the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment is the one that makes all the other ones possible. But it's also mm-hmm. about the Tenth Amendment and whether or not of states course. have sovereignty. And let me let me kind of dovetail with this. It drives mm-hmm. me bonkers. And, and attorneys are the worst about this. But everyone keeps saying, well, Federal government, the Constitution has a supremacy clause. The federal government's supreme. Like, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. They're not the supreme overlords. That's not what that means. The supremacy clause of the United States Constitution is an interpretive tool. It means that when you have a validly enacted federal statute that is part of their constitutional authority, like, for instance, immigration law. The mm-hmm. federal government is in charge of immigration, and they're supposed to be doing that job. They're not doing it right now, but they're supposed <laughs> to be doing that. So if there's a valid law on immigration and there's a conflicting state law, and that the, those two are irreconcilable, then the validly enacted federal law wins. But it doesn't mean that the federal government is supreme in all things and gets to make all decisions. Right. They're not a king talking down to their 50 subjects. They are, I, I'm totally with it. It makes, I wish more people saw it that way. 
Because there is a propensity to say the federal government of Washington, D.C. is the all-empowering, all-encompassing, magical place where all the rules come from. But that's simply not the way the system is designed. And, I mean, and our founders were smart enough to diffuse that authority over a limited federal government over three branches and then keep that residual power with the states and the people of states. And again, that's the whole point of the SAPA argument we're going to make. Oh, man, I, I wish you the best on that, because I think that is an excellent argument to bring forward to the, in the very least to public conversation, but also to the SCOTUS and those uh, just get those arguments. That would be amazing. So moving and pivoting a little bit, because you just kind of opened the door to something that I meant. I uh, saw that you tweeted around uh, one of apparently your favorite people, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. Um, this is something that I really caught my attention because you saw the letter he brought out. Right. Where he's like, yeah, I mean, I, we didn't mean to, but we kind of did. But we were kind of told to. Yeah, we censored all y'all. I mean, like, yeah, it, it was pretty clear what that letter stated. But you I'm going to quote the tweet that you put out because I think it's something that was intriguing and just enough where I wanted to ask you about it. So this is the quote that you put out a couple of days ago. Mark Zuckerberg's apology for censoring the American people rings hollow for the hundreds of thousands who remain shadow banned on his platforms. I haven't forgotten our work to preserve free speech is just getting started. My big question for you is, what do you mean by just getting started? Because you guys are involved in not just the Second Amendment. You were involved in the freedom of speech issue. You were involved in the um, student debt relief from the federal government issue. You guys are all everywhere. But what do you mean by that? Well, let's talk about the First Amendment. And, you know, that is a God-given right that protects our right to free speech, not only the speakers, but the listeners. Your audience has a right to hear from you. And when you have the federal government coercing big tech into silencing your voice, that violates our right to free speech. Uh, we know that relationship exists. We've uncovered it in our lawsuit, Missouri v. Biden, that went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, that bureaucracy, that uh, alphabet soup of federal bureaucracy, we're all engaged in a vast censorship enterprise in 2020, 2021 uh, to silence voices, specifically anyone who disagreed with the Biden administration. That means that 100 percent of the voices that were censored in violation of the First Amendment were conservative voices. Now, we went to the we got a preliminary injunction based on preliminary discovery. And the Supreme Court took the case. And so the case sat there stale for a year, waiting for a decision from the United States Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court essentially said, look, the government clearly violated the First Amendment in coercing big tech into censoring voices, but the states only presented evidence of that censoring happening in 2020, 2021. Well, that's because we've only been allowed to do preliminary discovery to get the preliminary injunction. So the Supreme Court sent us back down to the trial court level. I'm proud to announce that just this week, the United States District Court judge ordered discovery to commence. And we are going to use the tools of, of civil discovery to root out the vast censorship enterprise and demonstrate to the court that it still exists. Name one time in history the government has ever trampled on our liberty and then receded voluntarily. That doesn't happen. Right. That doesn't happen at all. Right. Government grows in the absence of checks and balances. So that's why it's important to keep this lawsuit going forward. Now, two different kinds of censorship, though. We're talking government censorship in violation of the First Amendment. Zuckerberg admitted to that and he admitted that happened. Mm -hmm. And I think what he's trying to do is punctuate the conversation and get everybody to stop paying attention. I think he's hedging his bets because he thinks President Trump may win, which he, he we got to make sure that happens. Right. <laughs> but he's hedging his bets. But there's still the corporate big tech censorship. And it is more nefarious and more dangerous than at any point in human history. And bear with me as I explain why. Yeah. When King George shut down a printing press, he, everyone knew he had done it, and he was only silencing one medium of communication, the printed word. But what's going on with these big tech oligarchs who disagree with people like you and me don't want us talking about the Second Amendment, don't want us talking about our freedom, because they don't like those things. When big tech censors us, it's they de they deplatform, they de-emphasize, they shadow ban. There's some leftist progressive turning dials that is muting our voices, your voice and my ability to hear from you. And they're not only muting the, the, the written word, the spoken word, but also uh, body language, visual imagery. It's a multi-dynamic form of communication that's going on right now. And so uh, this is, again, it's, it's clandestine and nefarious, the level of censorship going on in big tech. And so it's incumbent upon states to find ways to fight back. We've already got our lawsuit pending against the federal government, but we got to get creative and also fight back against this big tech oligarchic censorship as well. Yeah. And <laughs> I also think it's very important to tell my audience He's running for attorney general again. So that's what you're looking forward to. So let's get that. Let's make that happen. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let's definitely make that happen. Um, so the something that you just said and kind of wrapping the conversation, because I know your time is limited and I appreciate you spending the time with us. You mentioned something about discovery. And that is that's something that is so overlooked. And 
just from personal experience, because I mean, as when we met, we've had our conversations, I was, I'm so deep in the two way fight that I start to see patterns and the gun control um, auspices, they are in the middle of doing that exact same thing. So what they will do is they will say, Hey Glock, we're going to sue you from Chicago. And then we're going to get the attorneys general from every blue state to also put in, you know, basically request and say, Hey, don't you delete anything. We want all the information. We're going to go through discovery. That discovery thing is a big deal because you can actually, you have access to things that you normally wouldn't. Could you explain that really quickly for the audience, kind of high level? Yeah. And this is why offensive litigation is important to protect freedom. Mm -hmm. When you have these entities at the federal level and in, uh, you know, these massive big tech oligarchs uh, trampling on our rights and harming consumers and consolidating and manipulating marketplaces, uh, Offensive litigation is the only remedy that I'm aware of to uh, not only gain access to a peek behind the curtain of what's going on, but to, to gather the evidence necessary to push that lawsuit forward and win. And, uh, you know, Republicans have traditionally been antithetical to offensive litigation, have said, hey, look, we defend civil suits. We don't do plaintiff's work. Uh, right. and, and that worked for a time. But that's kind of a go along to get along mentality that is, is failing now. And so we've got to stay on the offense. Oh, absolutely. And failing in spades. I mean, you look at on any level where the Republicans and the Democrats differ on any type of policy, obviously my bailiwick's in the 2A, it is consistent. The Republicans are always on defense and they are always yielding ground to make the compromise. I mean, it is consistent. Yeah. We've just now seen over the past few years, two, three, four years, Republicans actually going on the offense, as you're mentioning. Like when we had, I think, I think the number was 19 constitutional carry states. And then within two or three years, we had 29. So, I mean, like we, we are moving the ball, yeah. but I think what you're doing is so important. You and all the other AGs around the nation in red states where you have the control and you've been voted into office. I think more of that and you start to move this ball on a different level than what we've done prior. I think what you're doing is amazing. I do thank you for that. That's awesome. No, I, I appreciate it. Let me, let me say this too. Like the caveat here is look, lawsuits are a game of whack-a-mole. At the end of the day, we need <laughs> structural change. And the best way to implement structural change is to elect Donald Trump president. And, and the way we're going to do that is making this thing too big to rig. If every mm -hmm. gun owner, if every shooter, if every sportsman in America registered to vote and took someone to the polls with them that was a fellow shooter, we win. Oh, we make dominate. it too big, too big to rig. And so that's why I'm telling everybody, go check out Vote for America, vote number four, America.org. Register to vote, register your buddy to vote, take, and then go one step further. Take them to the polling place in November we will prevail. We will make this thing too big to rig. If every gun owner makes their voice heard at the, po at the polling place, we win every time. Yeah. And I, that's such an amazing stat and kind of wrapping this conversation, the amount of influence that we just have that is just sitting there that is not activated. I mean, it, it truly is remarkable. 10 million people guys understand that the vote margins that we're talking about in these swing States last election it was ten thousand in one state it was four thousand another it was forty thousand i mean like we're talking small potatoes versus 10 million um and honestly i mean i think you'll agree the, the power is right in our hands we just have to take it i mean we the people yeah, we the we people the freedom loving people who exercise our right to keep and bear arms go to yep. voteforamerica.org sign up get a buddy sign them up and then take them to the polling place that's the key man it's a simple yep. recipe we can do this we can absolutely do it and so we're going to wrap out but do you want to tell people where they can find you all your social stuff your websites everything yeah i got an election in november too love people support check us out at baileymo.com that's baileymo.com andrew bailey mo on x uh love your support love being on this this channel man appreciate what you do covering these important issues i'll keep you updated look forward to talking again soon Oh, please do. And thank you again so much for coming. It was an absolute blast. Thank you, sir.